getting everybody's attention easy. So welcome you this morning. Appreciate you coming. Uh, I've been very excited about spending these weeks together looking at uh, our vision for and the mission of the church as it's recorded and revealed in scripture and as we strive to do here at Roebuck. Grateful that you've uh, gathered together and trust you'll be in prayer um, as we work through these times together. We, we do have some coffee brewing, should be done in a moment. There's a few muffins that were left over from yesterday's prayer breakfast, threw them in the fridge, so if you miss breakfast or you're still hungry, if you want to grab that, um, there's only a handful, so it's first come First serve, but they are there uh, if you want them and for your enjoyment. I'm going to open with a word of prayer uh, and we'll get going. These are being recorded, by the way. We'll put them on the website like we do with all of our sermons. So if somebody misses and you want to spread the word or if you want to go back and listen again, um, they are there. I also know we're used to discussion and questions during our Sunday school hour, so I welcome that. If I say something that provokes a question or a, or a point of of discussion, then, then I invite you to get my attention and bring that up, and that will only make our class better. So let's seek the Lord in a word of prayer, and we'll begin. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of gathering together on the Lord's Day. Thank you for the uh, scriptures, which are true, given by inspiration of God, protected from error, and our sole rule of faith and practice. And thank you that they're good, they're heartwarming, they're refreshing, they're Christ-centered, and we encounter the living God and his grace when we come to your word. As you challenge us through your word, Lord, help us to be quick to obey, to repent, and to rejoice in Christ our Savior. And give us wisdom and a clear mind as we work through this material. Thank you for our opportunity to do this. We pray that you would bless it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some time ago, the, we as a session discussed doing a special combined Sunday school session together in the new year. We were working through the book of Romans in our Sunday school class, and Romans 9 in particular, and good questions were arising, and, and good discussion was happening, and we, we thought as a session that it would be good to look at the topics of election and predestination together. And then I had the idea to preach the series on TULIP, the five points of Calvinism, and I, I felt that that study covered the base as well. There's still more we could look at, there's still more we could discuss, but, but we probed that topic with some depth, uh, we discussed it in all of the Wednesday nights that followed um, those five Sunday mornings, so I feel like that topic is, is well covered at the moment. We'll come back to it again throughout the course of the ministry here, uh, but with it being so recent, we decided to look at a new topic, and I submitted to the elders the idea of talking about the mission of the church and our vision for the church. What does the scripture say about God's church and how we can strive for the health and well-being of the church here at Roebuck. And so we're going to spend three weeks doing that. Now, ironically, some of the scriptures we'll look at will come from Romans 9. So there's always overlap between the different areas of truth that God reveals. But when we talk about a vision and a mission, uh, we're really talking about the nature of the church, the ministry that the church Performs. Most institutions, most corporations have some kind of vision and mission statement. I look around this room, I see a few District 6 employees. My children attend a District 6 school. You, you probably know that at least part of that mission statement is the words, uh, where children are always first. Every time I get a phone call or some kind of notification, you, you see those words. That comes from Spartanburg County District 6 mission statement which reads as following, Spartanburg School District 6, where children are always first, ensures the highest quality education for all children by providing a highly qualified staff, a challenging curriculum, first class facilities, and a safe and nurturing environment. That's their mission statement. That's what they're trying to do. They go on on their website to list a vision statement and also different beliefs because all of those are interconnected. Uh, what you want to be and how you're going to get there, and therefore what you believe all, to, all go together in one package. I think most of us in this room, at least, like to eat at Chick-fil-A. Uh, Chick-fil-A has a corporate purpose. I've referred to it in one of my messages before. They state that their corporate purpose is to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who come into contact 
with Chick-fil-A. And they drive that home to their employees through training. They have a really sentimental video. You can watch it on YouTube. They'll make you cry um, about just how they, how they try to impact everybody's life by serving their sandwiches. Now, as we come to talk about the church, I do want to be careful in comparing it or our mission statement to those kinds of corporate statements. Number one, it can sound a little corny when you start talking about vision statements and, and mission statements with reference to the church and, and you're bringing in Chick-fil-A. Well, we're not a restaurant, okay? We don't, we don't serve sandwiches, though we do like to eat, don't we? All right, it, it can be a little corny when you're talking that kind of language with reference to the church. It can also be a little dangerous. The church is not a business, The church is a spiritual organism, an institution created directly by Jesus Christ, by God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And while there may be some overlapping areas of common sense and wisdom, our marching orders, our goal, our our purpose, our, our strategy is very different from the corporate world or any other group. So you want to avoid those dangers. But at the same time, when we talk about the scriptures, they do talk about the church. The church is not something we've come up with or just inherited historically. The scriptures discuss what the church is as an organism, I said, and an institution before God. It talks about what the church ought to be, and it instructs us on how we can get there together as the people of God. To bring it back to this vision, mission language, your vision is what you want to be. You're looking down the horizon and you're able to articulate, this is what we want to be. This is where we want to go. Your mission then is how you will arrive at that goal. Your strategy. What will you do? What will you not do? The scriptures speak to those kinds of things. And so it's a relevant discussion for the fact of our existence as a church. One of the things I brag about at this church is the heavy involvement of all of the people, uh, the many areas of ministry that, that are overseen by different people in this church and in the ownership you take in, in all the different things that go on. And it makes my job very easy, and I'm, I'm genuinely grateful for it. Uh, this church accomplishes a lot. Let's say, though, our size doubled. Let's say our size tripled. And all that investment continued, we'd be doing even more, wouldn't we? But no matter how big we got, could we do everything there is to do? Could we do every good thing we could do in this community and beyond? No, you can't. You can't do everything. Your mission and your vision will define what you do and what you don't do and how you can therefore do the best as the people of God guided by the scriptures. So we could call a study like this then a philosophy of ministry. Uh, Why do we do what we do? Why do we not do what we don't? Why do we identify as Presbyterian? Why why do we put that on our sign and make that a part of our our confessional identity? Why not just say we're a Christian church or an evangelical church? Why do we identify as Presbyterian? What does that mean for us as Christians? How does all of this impact the way we do church? And we're going to look at God's word in order to answer those questions. We're going to learn a little truth, a little theology that that must always be the foundation of our practice. But I will also strive to make application to us as individuals, to us as a body. We, We want truth to lead to action, not just filling our heads with more information, but impacting our hearts and therefore our hands to go out and serve and glorify God. My approach then is to look at three topics over three weeks. Today, we will look at the nature of the church. What is the church? What is it? And how do you identify a true church? Secondly, the ministry of the church. What does the church and its people do? What's our function? What's our service? And thirdly, the government of the church. How do you structure a church? How do you oversee a church? How do you keep a church on the right track missionally? so to speak. We'll look at those over the next three weeks. Today, therefore, beginning with the nature of the church. And in looking at the nature of the church, we want to answer two questions. One, what is the church? And two, how do you identify a true church? We'll take those questions in that order. First, what is the church? Well, simple definition would be the assembly of God's people. Here we are in the fellowship room assembled together, gathered corporately. The church of Jesus Christ is the assembly of God's people, those people that God is gathering to himself in the world. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, I tell you that you are Peter, 
And on this rock, I will build my church. That word church translates the Greek word ekklesia, usually translated in other contexts as assembly, community. It was later in the, in the history of translation that church became the dominant word. Church has the, the small danger of, of course, bringing to our mind images of a building, a structure, a place you go to. But we are, in many ways, the church, the assembly, the community of God's people. The church's existence is rooted in the Old Testament. This word ekklesia, it's equivalent to the Hebrew word kahal, which again just means assembly congregation, to gather, to come together. And if you were to look that word up in the Old Testament, you would see it referring to the nation of Israel, often summoned to gather together and appear before the Lord. They would be numbered as the people of God, the assembly, the gathering of God's people. As we move into the New Testament, Israel is not so much replaced as it is reconstituted. And fulfilled by the church, an assembly of God's people with its roots in Israel, but now expanding out into the whole world, bringing Gentiles into its boundaries. Acts 15, 14, Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. What is God doing? Well, one thing he's doing in the world is he's gathering people from all nations to be a people for his name an assembly of those whom God has gathered. Now, we need to get a little more specific, though, in talking about the church as an assembly. We need to define it in two senses, and these are very historical. These are very common. You could probably guess them. The two senses are visible and invisible. The church is both visible and invisible. Let's take them in the opposite order. First, the church is invisible. And when we refer to the invisible church, here's what we mean. The whole number of God's elect. Every person that has been, is being, or will be saved in the history of redemption from the Old to the New Testaments. That assembly that we read about in Revelation 7, gathered before the throne at the end of time, the whole company of God's elect. Let me quote you from our confession, the Westminster Confession of Faith. If you want to note chapter 25, that is the chapter that discusses the church. Here from its first statement, the Catholic or universal church, those words are synonymous, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one. Under Christ, the head thereof, And is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians 5, verses 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You hear the the emphasis there in Ephesians. Christ died for the church. He died to gather to himself, to call to himself a bride. And at the end of time, that bride and all of her beauty and perfection will be presented to Christ, the husband and the head of that universal body. There will come a time when the invisible will be made visible. But as of right now, you can't see with your eyes the whole company of God's elect. Why? Some are in heaven. On earth, there's a mix within the church of saved and unsaved. And of course, those who are yet to be saved, we do not yet see. But at one point, when Jesus comes again and raises the righteous dead, together the elect will be gathered and the invisible church will be made visible. Two, then, we read in Scripture about the visible church. What we see, what we're participating in right now, now and will be in the next hour. What is the visible church? Well, that is all who profess the Christian faith and their children. And the two parts of that we will look at here in just a minute. All who profess the Christian faith, that is all who say, I belong to the company of the elect. I believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. I I trust in him alone. I believe that in my heart and I confess it with my lips and I'm therefore added to the membership of the church. The visible church involves all of those and together with their children. Again, from the confession, 25 
paragraph two. The visible church, which is also Catholic or universal under the gospel, is not confined to one nation as before under the law, but consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and of their children and is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house and family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. That last phrase we'll look at probably next week as we continue our studies. But first, the obvious point, that the visible church involves those who profess the Christian faith. You really don't get any debate on this, and it is abundantly clear from the record of Scripture. Listen to this quick progression through the opening chapter chapters of the book of Acts. Acts 2.38 and 41. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That's from the day of Pentecost. Peter's preaching to unrepentant Israelites, telling them you need to be saved, you need to be baptized, you need to be added to the church. Continuing through the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 4, but many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Chapter 5, verse 14, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So see, the, the, the institution is growing. More and more people are being added to the number. Notice it's not just they're being saved. What? They're being added to their number. Whatever membership looked like in the opening chapters of Acts, there was some way in which people were being identified with this body. They were believing, and they were also visibly being identified with this body, most commonly through baptism. Coming to chapter 9, then verse 31, here's the word. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. The growth of the visible church from the day of Pentecost, people are believing, being baptized, and added to the church. Thus, the church involves all who profess the Christian faith. Why do we add their children, though? In what sense do we mean that children are members of the church, and why do we even account them as members of the church at all? We'll say again more about this when we look at baptism, but let me say a little bit now. Notice what is said in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 39. This is right after Peter says, Okay, you unbelievers, you repent, you be baptized. In the very next breath, though, he says this. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Do you you see what Peter is saying? He is saying to the unrepentant Israelites, you need to believe. You need to embrace the gospel. But once you, as the head of a household, either father or mother, embrace that gospel, guess what? God's made a special promise now to your children. He intends not only to call you, he intends to call your children to himself. God's purpose is not one that just comes to you and terminates with you. God cares about your whole family. He cares about your spouse. He cares about the children that you either have or are yet to have. And says, I'm not just going to come to you, save you, be your God, and then go away. And now the next generation fends for itself. I'm going to come and save you and be your God. And I'm going to make special promises to your children. And this is directly patterned. Off of what we read, God saying to Abraham in Genesis 17, you, Abraham, have believed, you received circumcision. Now, guess what? I'm going to keep offering this promise to your descendants. So you circumcise them, you add them to the family of Israel, and then you preach the gospel to them and call on them to circumcise their hearts and believe what I have said. God's promise is for its generations to come. This is reflected, by the way, in Paul's words To the Corinthians, we may say, well, that that doesn't seem so clear to me that that now the children have a special relationship with the church. Okay, maybe God's promised to save them, but but on what grounds do we say they have a special relationship to the church? 1 Corinthians 7, 14. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, this verse is so helpful because Paul comes out right out and says, I'm talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about unbelieving spouses. And I'm talking about, presumably, unbelieving children at this point. But what does Paul say? 
because there is a believing parent in that home, I regard the spouse, I regard the children as in some measure holy. They have a certain special relationship to me, even though they are not yet believers. They are accounted as holy. When God saves the head of a household, he then welcomes the household into his visible assembly because now they enjoy a special relationship with him. They are not saved. They are not regenerated. They are not going to, oh, maybe get to heaven just on associations. Absolutely not. Should they not believe, their association will only condemn them the greater, sadly. But now they're brought into the community where they have greater exposure to the light. They encounter the living God in worship. They now have, maybe from a human perspective, more access and opportunity to hear the good news and believe. Again, why? Because God's purpose is to save households and then to save the generations that are yet to come. Thus, we talk about our children as members of the church, only in a visible sense and not in a saving sense yet, but as members of the church. Just think about it. There, we could go on and on. We'll say more about it. I'll, I'll make this point last and then we'll move on. What does Ephesians 6.1 say to children? We, we quote this to our children all the time, right? Before they can read or write. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. We are telling little ones who there's almost no chance they have any kind of regenerated heart at that point. You need to obey me in the Lord. Well, they're not saved. I thought only saved people could obey God. I thought only saved people were under obligations to do what God says. No, God says if they're your children, then they are now under the covenant obligations to obey you. And the covenant obligations are also that they must believe the gospel and repent. Last reference is Ezekiel 16, 20, 21. God actually talking to the Israelites who are sacrificing their children sadly says, those are my children you're sacrificing. God cares very much about the children of believers who are associated with his body visibly. Now, here's where Romans 9 comes in. We would be foolish to presume that just because they're associated with the body, they are therefore already saved. We hope that they will be. We believe they will be. We have good incentive to believe that the children of believers will come to faith in Christ. We're not so going to go so far as to assume, hey, I'm going to assume everything's okay until you prove me wrong. No, because what does Romans 9 say? It is not as though God's word has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Here's the tension of living in God's church. Not everybody who's a visible Israelite is a true Israelite. Paul doesn't use those adjectives, but I think we have to infer them. He says, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. You can be part of Israel and yet not be Israel. Why is that? Next verse. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. You can descend from Abraham and not be his child. Again, how? On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Visible Israel, with a, with a believing covenant head in Abraham, told to circumcise your children, bring them into this visible assembly, and do that every generation, and yet warn, don't get me wrong, not everybody in this assembly is a believer. Not everybody who's a part of this assembly knows God. Not everybody who's a part of this assembly, to speak frankly, is going to heaven. Only those who are children of the promise, meaning what? Only the children that believe the promise And the promise is, of course, the gospel. Only those who repent and believe, like faithful Abraham, will therefore be accounted as Abraham's children and full members of his body and full participants in God's redemptive kingdom. Confession of faith, again, 25.5. The purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error. And some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Nevertheless, there shall be always a church on earth to worship God according to his will. In other words, what is the confession saying? There's no perfect churches. There's no such thing as perfect regenerate membership. Some say membership in the church should only be to those who are regenerate. Well, even there, the best we can do is test their regenerate status based on what they say and do. We as elders take that very 
take that responsibility very seriously, but even there, nothing is foolproof. So even in a church where there is a you only get in by professing your faith and have any kind of membership that way, there's still church discipline sometime. Why? Because there can be unbelievers who fool us and only reveal later by their words or their life that they were not true believers. So there is within the church a mix of those who profess and, and believe versus those who only profess, or even those who are just flying under the radar. They've made no kind of profession yet. They haven't declared where they stand with the Lord. What you must guard against as a church, and we'll talk about this in week three when we look at officers, is, is having that balance of unbelievers grow to the point that now the church is filled more with unbelievers than believers and is thus degenerating to the point that there's no longer true Christian assembly at all. How do you do that? That will be week three, but for now, the second question just how do you spot a true church? If this is what the church is, but there could be some mixture in it, how do you spot a true church? And the answer is by looking for three essential marks. Before I give those, leaving the first question, any, any questions or interjections at this point? <clears throat> All right. Second question then. How do you identify a true church? By looking for three Essential marks, again, from the confession. This Catholic church hath been sometimes more, sometimes less visible. And particular churches, which are members thereof, are more or less pure, according as the doctrine of the gospel is taught and embraced, ordinances administered, and public worship performed more or less purely in them. Let's break those three down here in the few minutes we have left first mark of the true church, the true proclamation of the word, or in the words of the confession, according as the doctrine of the gospel is taught and embraced. Listen to Jesus' words in John 8. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. If you've ever been in my office, I have that painting hanging on the wall with that verse on it. It's such a powerful verse. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Galatians 1, verse 8, we know this one well. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. You hear how you can have preachers, even an angel from heaven, Paul postulates, probably speaking somewhat hypothetically, but trying to make his point very clear. You could have churches and preachers who preach another gospel. And when they do that, they are under God's curse. They are no longer regarded as true churches. They are no longer regarded as true messengers. The message they preach would doom and damn souls rather than leading them to life everlasting. So the first and foremost mark of a true church is that we rightly preach the gospel. We preach the gospel in all of its clarity, namely faith alone in Christ alone, those fundamental heads of doctrine. Now, I won't go too far on this, but, but what's interesting, by the way, is those fundamental heads of doctrine are then interconnected with other doctrines. That's why we don't just say, hey, look, we believe these three or four doctrines. You could print them on the back of a business card. And if you believe that, well, then, then you believe everything we believe. If you believe those, you can join the church. But we believe more than that. Why? Well, we believe that for faith to be in Christ, well, we have to say something about Christ. Is he God and man? Is he just kind of God? Is he not a real man? How's all that work together? How does that interact with the ideas of the Trinity? How does that interact with what Christ did in his earthly life and whether or not he really died on a cross and rose again? Whole bunch of things that we must articulate in order to give you the true gospel and the full gospel. You may not know all those when you believe, but they are things that believers will embrace as they are taught from Scripture. Moving into secondary things, and again, we wouldn't say that people have to believe this to be saved, but we believe the gospel touches on more than just salvation, though. What I believe about the sovereignty of God and salvation, that, that affects how I enjoy the gospel. What I believe about man's nature affects how I will preach the gospel and how I will appeal to people to be converted. What I think about the death of Christ and the calling of the Spirit says a lot about my enjoyment of Christ. Not fundamentals, but they can still make the gospel stronger or weaker. I'm preaching and teaching to you today from, from what we call a covenantal perspective. 
that the body of Christ in the New Testament is very much like, in many ways, the assembly of Israel in the Old Testament, that it involves all those who profess the faith and their children. Not to be snobby, but I think this is superior to a dispensational view of looking at Israel and the church as totally separate and should be run in totally separate ways. I think that impacts how you enjoy Christ. I think it impacts how you parent. I think it impacts how you, how you rest in the Savior and read the scriptures and learn more about faith and how God has blessed his people with the gospel in all the ages. So you don't need to know or believe all that to be a part of this church, but we believe that articulating that is vital to the health of the church, the true proclamation of the word, and in addition, some of the doctrines that are connected with it. Two, the right administration of the sacraments, or as the confession said, according as ordinances are administered. And the obvious question is, well, how do you rightly administer a sacrament? By making sure that it makes the gospel central. Two and three on these marks are all going to flow out of one. A sacrament is rightly administered when it makes the gospel central and when it reflects accurately on the gospel of faith alone. Let me explain. Christ has ordained two sacraments. What are they? Do you know? What are the two sacraments in Christ's church? Don't even have to raise your hand. Baptism. Baptism. Lord's Supper. Very good. These are the two sacraments that Christ has ordained in the word. They are ordained because what they do is they preach the gospel to us in visible form, make much of aesthetics and what you can see and experience at church. We do have symbols in the Christian church. We have baptism and we have the Lord's table. These preach the gospel to us in visible form. Do they affect regeneration? Does administering baptism to an adult or a children or a child give them spiritual life? Don't be afraid to answer. No way. That's exactly right. Does coming to the Lord's table, if you are an unbeliever, spiritually awaken and convert you? Absolutely not. They present the gospel to us in visible form. They do not affect regeneration and faith. But what do they do? They nourish our souls. They strengthen our faith. They give us a greater enjoyment of God's grace. They they present to us the, the doctrines of the word. And that's why you never do baptism in the Lord's table without the word. This tells you what those ordinances are all about and how you can enjoy them. What is baptism picture? Again, summary form, because we'll look at it next week. It pictures spiritual washing, new life. What God does when he unites a person to Jesus Christ. Listen to Titus 3.5. It's going to talk about salvation, but listen to all the baptism language. Titus 3.5. He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Now we misread that if we say, oh, he saves us by baptizing us. Because when we're baptized, we're washed and renewed. No, It's the other way around. Baptism is a picture of that saving work, that renewing work, that washing work that God does when he saves someone. This is all anticipated in Ezekiel and comes front and center in the New Testament. By the way, when I say that baptism pictures that, it's very possible and appropriate that you would say, well, why would you then give it to an unbeliever? Why would you give it to a child? I'll tell you that next week. Gotta come back. For now... I would say it's wrongly administered, though, when we say, okay, you just do this and everything's good. And, and there are, don't get me wrong, there's few people that would say it that crassly from any Christian tradition assembly. What few people are going to say, oh, do this, you're good to go. But what they are saying is, look, objectively, this is going to give spiritual life. Objectively, this is going to bring a person into fellowship with God. And that's a wrong administration of the sacrament. Why? Because it's no longer picturing salvation. Now it is salvation. It's no longer leading you to the point where you need to consider the gospel and put your trust in the gospel and fellowship with Christ through the gospel and thus strengthen your faith through the gospel. Or maybe as an unbeliever, see that and say, oh, I need to do that. I need to believe in Jesus Christ. No, now it's your salvation. It's taken all your focus off Christ. It's put it on the work itself. And that's not the gospel. That's not salvation. I believe, by the way, too, that we diminish the sacraments. Don't deny them, but we diminish them When we present them as, this is you telling other people what you believe. You need to get baptized. Why? You need to tell the world you're a follower of Christ. 
You need to observe the Lord's table. Why? You need, you need to tell people what you believe. The sacraments are not about us telling other people what we believe and do. The sacraments are about God saying, this is what I do for you when I save you. That's why we wash from the outside. God's saying, I'll come from the outside to wash you and to save you. The Lord's table is not me saying I'm a believer. It's saying, this is my body, which is given for you. And you do this in remembrance of me. It is all about what God does for us in salvation. And thus we can partake of those things with faith and we can reflect on and embrace the promises about salvation. Whether again, thinking back on our baptism, receiving it as a new believer, fellowshiping at the Lord's table. Quickly, the Lord's table, as I've already said, represents the body and blood of Christ. And when we partake of that by faith, it's not just a symbol. It's not just saying, hey, remember, Jesus died for you. Though it it says that, let's not diminish that a bit. But listen to 1 Corinthians 10. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 10, 16. What is Paul saying? The bread which represents the body When you partake of it by faith, there is participation with the body of Christ. When you drink that grape juice, when you drink that wine, it symbolizes the blood of Christ. And Paul says, when you take it by faith, there is fellowship, communion with Christ, with the spiritual presence nourishing us through grace of the risen Christ in our midst. It strengthens our souls. We wrongly administer them if we say, this is your salvation. Then we destroy the gospel. Thirdly, finally, last mark of the church is the faithful exercise of church discipline. What this refers to is it is the job of the elders to admit to membership in the church only those who profess the faith. Their children are administered or admitted as visible members, members of the visible body. But when it comes to being a full member of this church, one who will eat at the Lord's table, one who will take part in the government of this church by electing elders, deacons, calling pastors, voting in meetings when, they're, when they are called. In order to be that kind of member of the church, the, the member who is functioning as a spiritually responsible, gifted believer, we, we say that you must be a believer. Child baptized because of a believing parent, you are a visible member of the church, you have special privileges. Full member of the body, you must profess your faith in order to be all the way in and full partaker of God's grace. And it's the elder's job to screen those, so to speak. When people want to be made members of the church, we have to ask them, what do you believe? We have to hear them articulate that they believe the gospel, that they embrace the gospel, that they're trusting in Christ for salvation. Whether it was a dramatic moment early in life that they remember, or whether it's just, look, I'm telling you right now, if I died and stood before God, I am trusting in the blood of Christ to get me into heaven. We have to make sure that we only admit to full membership those who make that profession of faith. And at the same time, it is our job as elders to watch those that we have admitted in order to care from their souls and make sure that they do not poison their own souls and even possibly fall away from the faith. That's why we have church discipline. I don't know what your experience of church discipline has been like. It might be very negative. You're thinking negative like a police state church that watches everything you do and comes after you for minor things that are never forbidden in God's word. That's not what we mean here at all. What we mean here is that the elders we have care about your soul. We care about your walk with God. We're not here to spy on you or be all in your business, but as we get to know you and love you and fellowship with you, if there's something there that we say, look, this, this could bring somebody away from Christ, then we care. We're going to talk. Why? Because we love you and we care very much for the well-being of your soul. That's why we as elders watch for the welfare of the children of this church and strive to minister in such a way that at some point they themselves will profess the faith and be added to the Lord's table. Isn't that a great thing when children grow up in the church and embrace the faith and say, I don't remember a day I didn't believe in Jesus Christ. That's a great testimony and it's what we strive for as a body. But it's our job. We do it joyfully, we do it happily, but sometimes it's serious because we care about where people are with the Lord. Romans sixteen seventeen. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. First Corinthians 5, Paul, because the elders weren't doing their job, used his apostolic authority to remove a man from the church who was sleeping with his father's wife. 
hopefully in the hope that he would repent and come in Christ in faith to salvation. There's evidence from 2 Corinthians that he very may well have. That is always the intent, of course, of church discipline, to rescue souls, not to damn them. Finally, Revelation 2, 14 and 16, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The church held accountable to make sure there was not false teaching in its midst, especially of the kind that would damn souls or lead them to immorality. What is the church, the assembly of God's people, visibly those who profess the faith and their children, invisibly the whole company of the elect, all true believers? How do you spot that church? It manifests itself on earth. How do you spot it? The true preaching of the word, the right administration of the sacraments, the faithful exercise of discipline. What does this mean for us as a body, as individuals? It means this, the gospel is everything. The church is founded and centered upon the gospel. That's where we start. It's a little trendy way of talking. You can see gospel-centered everything today in in the marketplace. But you know what? It's a healthy reminder that the first priority of the church and our central doctrine is the gospel. Not what you do for God, but what God and Christ has done for you in order to save you from sin and to equip you to live a fruitful life in his service. We want to make it crystal clear what the gospel is, all that it entails, how it impacts your life. Secondly, church is a place where we have the gospel. Church is a place where you're nourished by the gospel. Again, depending on your experience, this may have been an area of growth for you, but but sometimes we have to be reminded that church is good for us. It can seem like a duty, or, or maybe there's been bad experiences in one's past. Church is good for us when the gospel is there. When it's rightly preached, it nourishes our souls. It does good for our young ones. Every week we encounter the living God. We are nourished by his grace, and that will sustain you as you go out during your life to fulfill the callings God has given to you. It's not your net. I I, I never discourage private Bible reading and prayer. But you know what really strengthens your faith? You know what meal lasts? You're at God's house hearing the word preached and nourishing with the risen Christ. You, You encounter God in a way here. You will not encounter him on your own. And he nourishes your soul in a special way. Sean Lucas writes, everything that is necessary for communion with God in Christ is found in Christ's church. And again, we say that out of one of these guilt things. Hey, you need to be here. You're missing out. You're not here. It's a way of saying, come. This is a good place to be. And God will nourish our souls. All right. We've come up against time. Any questions, though, before we break? All right. Let's pray. Give thanks for God's grace. Father in heaven, thank you for your mercy. Bless us as we go to worship. May these weeks, considering your church encourage and edify and make us enthusiastic for the work of God in our lives and in our community and our families. Would you teach us truth and maybe go out rejoicing in Jesus Christ. Thank you for his mercies. Thank you for his grace, we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you all.